Computer viruses, malware, spyware, trojans, worms, are all these terms referring to the same thing? And the answer is technically no, they are different. And we're gonna go over what these differences are, whether it's how they spread or what these things do to your computer. So maybe it's just out of curiosity or it can help you protect your computer going forward. The first term we can go over is pretty simple, which is malware. And this refers to any and all kinds of malicious software. It's an all encompassing term for any type of software that does harm to a computer. And all the terms we're gonna be talking about in this video could be considered malware. It's like an umbrella term, but there are lots of subgroups. So we're gonna go over the different categories and types of malware. There aren't really too many, but when it comes down to it, all malware usually has the same goal, which is to make money illegally for the creator of the malware. The first term we can talk about is a computer virus, which is usually the term that most people use all the time, but it's not actually the most common type of malware. We'll get to that in a bit. But regardless, a computer virus is basically the name for malicious software that when executed replicates itself by modifying files for other programs and possibly including the operating system itself. So that way, because these files are modified to now include the virus, whenever that program or the operating system is started, then it will also run the virus code. And this could be for any number of reasons, stealing personal information, taking control of the computer and using its computer power or storage for something that the author of the virus wanted. Lots of typical virus stuff you can imagine. But really the main differentiator for a virus is that it remains dormant until it's actually run by the user and then when it is, it replicates itself in some way. And this file may come in the form of an exe file, which is executed directly, or perhaps it's embedded in a macro in a Microsoft Word document or something like that. So when you run the program Microsoft Word, it exploits that and executes and then embeds itself in the rest of the computer that way. So again, downloading the file is not enough to infect your computer, but once you do run it, presumably thinking it's something else, then it does its virus thing. And it may spread itself by sending out an email to all your contacts, the same way it was infecting you that way perhaps, or maybe it puts itself in the upload folder for BitTorrent, so then it also uploads itself to the file sharing service so other people will download it, something like that. So really the term virus has two qualities. It describes how it's spread, which is it self replicates, and it's also run manually by a user. Now the next term might seem a bit similar, and that is a computer worm. So this also self replicates, but it also has a very important difference in that unlike a virus, which needs to be manually run by a user, a computer worm can spread itself automatically with out user intervention. So this means it doesn't need a host program to run like MS Word or the exe file that you need to run. It can do this automatically. It basically scans for other computers on the network that it can infect and then it does so automatically if it's able to. Of course, a worm will probably also have the ability to be run manually by a user and infect computers that way. That might be how it initially gets started within a network and then spreads automatically from there, from that first person doing it. And worms actually spread using vulnerabilities and exploits of operating systems themselves to infect all the computers in a network. So once one computer is infected, it scans, like I said, all the other computers on the network, sees if any other computers have that same vulnerability, and then infects them automatically without any user transferring files or anything like that. It all happens automatically in the background from the virus itself. And if you're wondering, wait a minute, how can the worm spread to other computers if the user isn't actually even running it? Well, it shouldn't be able to, and that's why it is an exploit of a vulnerability. The operating system is not designed to work like that, but for whatever reason, the worm is able to trick the operating system in not only downloading that file and downloading the worm, but also running it with zero user intervention because of that exploit. Now again, the term worm only describes the software based on how it spreads and replicates. It doesn't actually say or define what it does once it does infect things. In fact, apparently most computer worms don't actually contain a so-called payload, which is like side code that will do virus stuff that you typically think of, like spying on it or damaging the computer. So it might just spread just for the heck of spreading, but that doesn't mean that it won't harm the network. It still uses up CPU power and bandwidth and stuff like that. But if it does happen to have a payload, it could do any number of things that you typically associate with malware. 
software, such as encrypting files for ransomware, spying and stealing credit card information, or even installing a so-called backdoor, which might allow the computer to be controlled by the creator of the worm, and then added into a botnet to do all sorts of malicious things as a group with other computers. And worms are just one more example of why you need to keep your operating system up to date because that's just one example of software that can take advantage of exploits in your operating system, usually older versions after they've been discovered and people don't update and it's a hacker's dream to be able to take advantage of these things and really it's so easy to avoid. Just keep your software up to date. So both viruses and worms spread themselves and replicate themselves in one way or another, whether it's manually by a user or automatically through a worm, but there are plenty of other types of malware that don't replicate themselves but are just as destructive. So the next type we can mention are Trojans or Trojan horses which is a type of malware that misrepresents itself as a normal or benign program, but really it in the background will be doing malicious things. So it basically tricks the user into installing it because it thinks it's something else. It thinks it's something legitimate. And typically Trojans are the most common type of malware out there. And they may actually look like real programs. They may, they may run, they may do their intended purpose. Like if it's a calculator app or something, it might actually be able to calculate things and look like a calculator, but its main purpose is to get you to download it thinking it's just a calculator and then it does all this other stuff behind the scenes without you knowing. Another really common example are fake antivirus programs that tell you, oh, look how many computer viruses and infections we found. You better buy our premium package to remove all these when in reality, that antivirus program itself is the virus, it's fake. And these Trojans can be spread in any number of ways that you can imagine, such as spam email attachments that come out of the blue. They might be fake advertisements or through social media, stuff like that. But again, the main differentiator between a Trojan and say a virus is that a Trojan doesn't inject itself into other files of other programs and doesn't replicate itself and send it to other people or anything like that. If it did, it would be considered a virus. So so those three categories, viruses, worms, and trojans, typically describe the way that the malware spreads, but they don't talk about how much or necessarily what damage they do once they do infect. And there are categories for that that we can talk about next. The first of these is spyware, which just like the name suggests is software or malware that spies on you or collects information from the computer and then sends it somewhere else. Now, technically spyware could include programs that aren't even illegal, like you do give them permission to spy on you and collect information, but usually the vast majority of the time when someone says spyware, they're referring to malware that did not get your permission to collect any information at all, and it is malicious. And spyware could come in lots of different flavors. It could be a key logger, which literally collects every single letter that you type in, hoping to collect passwords or credit card numbers or bank accounts and stuff like that. It may also monitor what you're doing online and monitoring your web traffic to be able to inject things into it, such as advertisements, or maybe replacing links with affiliate links or advertisements to websites that it wasn't necessarily going to direct to. And usually malware that adds advertisements to your computer in one way or another is typically referred to as adware. So it may be that some of the malware that we talk about in this video may actually fall under multiple categories. Another couple big categories are scareware and ransomware. Ransomware may be considered a subcategory of scareware. We'll get to that. But scareware is typically some sort of malware that tricks a user into paying money or doing something by scaring them or threatening them. So one example might be a virus or a Trojan or whatever that pops up on the screen, a big thing that says, you're being arrested by the FBI unless you pay up this money as a fine or something like that. It scares you, it's like, oh my God, I don't wanna get arrested. And then some people might actually pay or a lot like those IRS scams that you get on the phone. It might be something similar on the computer. It says, if you don't send this much Bitcoin to this address, then the IRS is gonna arrest you and you're gonna go to jail. But it doesn't necessarily have to threaten you. It could be, again, just to scare you. A lot of advertisements, for example, that are kind of sketchy, you've probably seen them. It says, your computer is infected with so many viruses, click here to clean your computer and all that sort of thing. Obviously, it doesn't know if your computer is infected or not. It's just trying to scare you into doing it. And that would be scareware. Now, ransomware is a form of scareware that will typically hold your computer hostage in one way or another until you usually 
pay some sort of amount of money. Sometimes ransomware may just be kind of bluffing and it only locks your computer in a way that's pretty easy to reverse if you know what you're doing and it doesn't actually affect any of your files. But other times ransomware does have teeth and it actually will encrypt your files, for example. And it says, if you don't pay us this amount of money within this amount of time, we're gonna destroy the decryption key and your files will actually be gone. And the reason they do this is because if people know that there's software out there that this one isn't bluffing, then they're a lot more likely to pay up to get their files back if they haven't backed up, for example. All right, now the final type of malware we're gonna talk about in this video at least is rootkits. And rootkits usually take over the computer by gaining elevated privileges or administrative privileges. And the name rootkit comes from the term root privileges, which just means something that has control over the deepest, most secure parts of the operating system. And because this type of malware does have such deep control over the computer, it can hide itself very well. It literally has control over everything. It can even hide itself by not even including itself in the list of processes, like in the task manager or something like that, complete control. And this obviously means it's gonna be very, very hard to remove, if not impossible, because it will even have control over the programs that are meant to remove it, such as antivirus programs. It could prevent you from installing antivirus programs, it can stop those antivirus programs from running, stuff like that. So a lot of times, especially if the rootkit is embedded in the kernel, which is the core of the operating system, usually if you get a rootkit, the best thing is to just completely wipe the drive and reinstall the operating system from scratch, because you don't know if you actually removed everything and if it's actually still hiding and waiting to reinstall itself later. And rootkits usually are able to install themselves using operating system vulnerabilities and exploits, like we kind of talked about before, or stealing admin credentials or using credentials it found to then take over. Now at this point, you might be worried. You're like, oh, how do I protect myself? And there's really three things you can do that will almost certainly protect you 99% of the time. And the first of these is to, of course, keep your operating system and software up to date. I've said this so many times. Do not skip Windows updates. Update as soon as you get the ability to. And that way, if you get like a zero day vulnerability, which is something that was just discovered and released immediately to the public, and hackers will be jumping on that to try and get people who don't update right away. So keep stuff up to date and you'll be protected from any exploits. The next thing, which is really important, I've said this before again, is to back up your data. Have backup copies of your data, hopefully on a external hard drive that is not connected to the computer, so a ransomware can't encrypt the backup as well, or using something like cloud backup that is off site. This way, if you do get malware that harms your files or does something else to your computer that requires a reinstallation of your OS, it'll be way easier to recover them, especially in the case of ransomware. And finally, the third major thing is to use some sort of antivirus. I mean, it's better than nothing to have the one that's built into your computer, such as Windows Defender, whatever it's called now. Again, better than nothing if you know what you're doing, but ideally you use a type of antivirus that has something called internet security, which usually kind of scans for things coming across the network and usually can block things before they ever even get to your computer. And a lot of these antiviruses also have anti-ransomware features that will stop a program from running if it sees that it's modifying files like ransomware might do. If you're looking for suggestions for some options for antiviruses, one good option is Bitdefender. Full disclosure, they did sponsor a previous video of mine, but they're not sponsoring this one. There's no sponsor for this video. Another good option is ESET Knob32. I've used them in the past, haven't had any problems. But really, you can just go on Google and search best antivirus current year at the end of it and look at tests and see what one is the best for the current year. So hopefully that clears things up. If you didn't know about the differences between names of other types of malware, now you do, and you might have a better understanding of how certain types of malware spread so you can better defend your computer against it. You'll kind of know what you're up against. If you guys want, you can keep watching by clicking some other videos I have on here and on my channel, and be sure to let me know what you think down in the comment section. Did you know about these, or is there something I forgot about? We could talk about that down in the comments. So again, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you want to subscribe, I make a few new videos every week. So until next time, be seeing you.